Ladies and, gen Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Food security concerns many parts of the world, with African countries in particular facing serious challenges to ensure an adequate supply of homegrown nutritious food. Africa's agricultural sector currently produces less than half the global average and only about 25% of its total potential yield. To meet the demands of Africa's exploding population, the effects of climate change, and the depletion of soil, agricultural practices need to be modernized across the continent. During the 1960s, the Green Revolution did just that in many parts of the world. However, the success of this model has yet to be replicated in Africa. How can traditional smallholder and family farmers benefit from a green revolution? And how can modern agricultural technologies and practices be made more affordable? How can African governments engineer a green revolution to increase food productivity and build a sustainable food production system? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the world editor of the Miami Herald, Mr. John Yearwood. Th thank you all very, very much. Driving a green revolution in Africa over the next hour and a half or so, hopefully be a little bit uh, less than that, uh, you will hear not only about the problem, but also about the solution. And we have a really outstanding panel uh, to talk to us through uh, these really important issues. Please help me in welcoming the panel to the Atlantic Dialogue. Let's start the conversation with President Obasanjo. Mr. President, welcome back to the Atlantic Dialogues. Thank you. You've been uh, closely looking and examining this issue, certainly as a president and now as a former leader. Could you look at other countries around the world that have had this problem, that have dealt with it, and look at examples that Africa could follow? You want to look well, at that? Thank you very much. I, I think in recent... Uh, times um, is the um, story of what I call the success story of green revolution in India and Pakistan. Now, if we look back um, at the end of the Second World War, India, only one, th only two thirds of Indian population were adequately fed. One third was underfed. About 100 million people were uh, hungry, with, in fact, people dying of starvation in the streets of Calcutta and other big cities. Now, that was the situation until about 1956, when India started importing wheat from the uh, uh, Food for Peace program from the U.S., and that went on until the uh, 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 dwarf uh, wheat variety in Mexico, which was spearheaded under Norman Bullock. And that was the beginning of the uh, uh, Green Revolution in India and Pakistan. Roman Bullock had the uh, technology. The Indian government and Pakistan, uh, Pakistan uh, government uh, had the political will and the technology, the political will, 
the psychology to uh, convince the farmer to do uh, to try something new under a, uh, a recommend, uh, the recommendations and the economy, the economic aspect to make available the seed, the fertilizer, the other inputs, the pesticides, and um, all that put together made what now uh, we call Green Revolution in India and Pakistan. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Before we move on to Dr. Chairman Tarab, I want to take this opportunity to tell the audience that this conversation we are having is really about you. And what we would like to do is to get you as engaged in this conversation as possible. Certainly, I'm here to help facilitate this conversation. But what we really want is to hear your ideas. And um, you know, some people may say that you, you are the smartest people in the room. I hope our, uh, our, our panelists don't mind me saying that. But having said that, though, uh, you, you've been involved uh, previously in the whole uh, spot me technology. And um, I want to take this opportunity to at least start that process. The president talked about India and Pakistan and, and Africa uh, looking at modeling uh, what happened in uh, India and Pakistan. Uh, I'm curious in trying to get what you think, which countries, if you look at your uh, your spot me um, uh, devices, which country would you like, you think Africa can learn the most from uh, when it comes to uh, uh, this green revolution? I know, the, as I mentioned, the president talked about um, India, Pakistan, there might be other countries out there that you are familiar with. So we'll do a word cloud that I would like to see your responses. You have 45 seconds. Let's see, I'm seeing Brazil, Mexico. Interesting. India, Korea, Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to who put Zimbabwe in a minute, actually. Uh, Morocco. And uh, let's see, Brazil is getting bigger as well. Nine seconds left. Uh, four seconds, three, two, one. OK, so there's some good answers up there. Brazil, uh, Morocco, India, and uh, some Mexico. I think I see the Ivory Coast. But Morocco, Dr. Tarab, which uh, brings us to your part of the presentation, you've talked about Africa not only feeding itself, but also feeding the world. Certainly, no pun intended. I'm wondering, is that pie in the sky? Well, it is if you don't look at it the, uh, with science and the, and the right figures. Uh, let's look at that proposition. Uh, you know, if, if, you look, if you consider that uh, in 2050, each one of us, you know, worldwide, would have half the arable land that we have today to feed ourselves, and that 60% of remaining arable land, untouched arable land, is in Africa, that Africa is only using 20% of its arable land today, <coughs> then I think it's, it's very clear to see that Africa is going to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. But if the, the, the point I'd like to make here is that once you think that way, uh, you know, President Obasanjo talked rightly about the imperative of policies and political will. Unfortunately, those numbers, those figures, that reasoning does not translate today in political will. Because if we were to realize that Africa is going to feed the world indeed, that it's going to be essential over the next decade, then we should all be very keen to spearhead a green revolution in Africa. Uh, and, 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 and I'm not saying, it, it's almost like global warming. You know, a few policymakers think about it, but when it comes to decision making, when it comes to programs, uh, that's not uh, there yet. There's a small light, and uh, very recently we have a new, uh, you know, head of the African Development Bank that comes from your country, 
who was the Minister of Agriculture and I think understands very well the challenge. I would just add one point here. Looking at other experiences is important, and indeed Brazil was not cited early, but it's very relevant to a lot of the ecosystems in, in Africa. Uh, but the, the movie talked about making sure that the small farmer benefits from the Green Revolution in Africa. I would say, let's make sure that the small farmer is at the center. There's, the Green Revolution in Africa should be different than that elsewhere. It should make the small farmer at the center of it to preserve the huge, rich biodiversity of Africa. Otherwise, we run the risk of uh, destroying that. But this is a really interesting point, and I, I think I want us to go back to the whole spot me <coughs> technology on uh, the point you were making about Africa's ability not only to feed itself, but also to feed the world. And I'd like to ask the audience whether you think, yes or no, that Africa has that uh, ability or capability not only of feeding itself, but feeding the world. And uh, yes or no, and you have, uh, I think, 15 seconds, and uh, let's see how, what uh, the audience thinks. We, we can't vote here. I mean, this, uh, people. <laughs> <laughs> this is not democracy. <laughs> well, 76. Dr. Dr. Tarib, let me make a uh, suggestion to you. You may want to consider running for office. <laughs> You've got a lot of supporters in the room. Uh, let's go to Minister uh, Levy. And by the way, I want to thank you for being here. I know you have uh, a number of challenges at home, and we're um, really grateful for you uh, to take the time to be uh, with us uh, here today. Uh, but uh, in looking at uh, whether Africa can feed itself, certainly uh, some people may argue that Africa may need help from different countries, such as Brazil. Is Brazil uh, prepared to help, and what can Brazil, uh, Brazil do? Well, thank you. It's uh, very good to be here. And uh, I think this conversation is really important. <laughs> uh, Brazil has gone through a green revolution. And uh, it's a green revolution that has both large-scale uh, agriculture enterprises, but also one that has created enormous value for a small uh, fa how, uh, family farming and small farming. It's, it's, it's an ecosystem where you have place uh, for both, and I think it is really part of the success. Um, uh, for instance, a uh, large part of black beans, which is a very popular thing in Brazil, is basically produced by small farmers, and uh, the output continues to increase, the quality continues to increase, and brings income to, to a lot of people. At the same time, of course, you had in the savannas uh, the, the soybeans uh, that had uh, really created an enormous surplus and is feeding a large part of Asia together with other imports and complementing the local production. Uh, so I think that shows that without perhaps much noise, uh, you can have a very significant uh, revolution. It also opened up many areas in Brazil, and after an initial uh, surge, it also has created a strong environmental, uh, uh, say, conscience, awareness there. And uh, I would say that uh, one additional thing interesting about this revolution in Brazil, that it has become more and more uh, geared to our, towards making it sustainable and towards making it uh, really reducing carbon emissions. We, we have what you call agriculture for low carbon emissions, which is the next step of this transformation. Uh, we have to consider that, as in other places, the big trick is to increase productivity. So if you decompose the sharp increase, more than doubling in the production, of uh, agriculture in Brazil, a tiny part is uh, taking more land, and the big part is uh, uh, having more productivity. And there it is interesting, uh, because uh, you had a number of factors, and a global factor, that shows the importance also of cooperation and of trade. We had cooperations early on with the Japanese, something that actually now we're trying to, to bring <coughs> to Mozambique, to work in developing some technologies for the savannah with our experience and also with the support of the Japanese to really open up these areas in Mozambique, which is a large country, to produce also cereals. 
And I think this has uh, all the, the, the chance of being very successful. One interesting thing is that 50 years ago, people would say that, well, most of the land in Brazil were not appropriate for uh, agriculture. It's not that we didn't have water. It, it was too acid. And there comes the role of, uh, of uh, trade and the role of, of Morocco. Very important. Because in changing the, the, the pH of the soil and improving the, the soil, tiny adjustments sometimes, uh, but that require a special product and phosphates and, and things that come from, from, from Morocco, uh, you, you really increase the yield dramatically. So this combination of uh, uh, getting the, the adjustments sometimes in the soil, you have to do the research, you have to, to find a way to do it, and you can do it uh, through trade, and that creates uh, wealth, and, 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 uh, and uh, new opportunities, sometimes for unexpected partners who would think that uh, so much of the Brazilian agriculture would already come from Africa. And I'm sure that when we, we have it more in Africa, you also increase the links and the commercial links within Africa. So I think that, that agriculture, at least from our own experience, and of course, we don't try to, to export models or anything like this, but from our own experience, is something that can transform your balance of payments, can transform the, the, the quality of life of people. Um, I think something that just gives a sense. And of course, I have a middle class uh, background. Well, 30 or 40 years ago, even I mentioned black beans. The quality of black beans for middle class, I'm not talking to poor people, was much uh, lower than it's today. Why? Because the whole agricultural sector has improved in its productivity, in its quality, and changed lives, not only by the, the, the wealth produced for those who are in the sector, but for the welfare of all classes. Uh, we don't have uh, hunger in Brazil. We never had real hunger, but you have underfeeding in the past. That's also overcome because of this green revolution of the last 20, 30 years. So I think the prospects of Africa are tremendous. And we are participating, I would not say helping, but participating in that in a number of ways, of technical assistance, sometimes of providing machinery and techniques, having this kind of joint product with other partners, like I mentioned in Mozambique, and in many countries, even in the islands uh, of, of the Atlantic, where we share the Portuguese uh, uh, background, we are present. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, uh, even because of cultural ties, we can make a difference because we see so much potential in this green revolution. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Uh, you mentioned innovation, which is a very good point. I'd like to return to that a little bit later in the conversation, particularly with the chairman. But I want to move now to um, Senegal and uh, Dr. Gadio. Several years ago, um, your former president, Dr. Wad, um, uh, talked to me about uh, peanuts, which is something that uh, he always talked about, the battles he fought with the Chinese uh, over peanuts. His wife, Madame Wad, talked about uh, BSOP uh, at her BSOP farm. Can Senegal, uh, can Senegal do this by itself? Uh, thank you so much. And if you allow me to uh, do so, I would not like to discuss uh, what the family's uh, approach to <laughs> agriculture. <laughs> I, I, highly, I highly respect, I highly respect uh, President Wad, and who was a good friend of President Obasanjo and myself. And um, as a man who has ideas, people respect him for that, you know? Uh, President Chirag used to say that he has one idea per minute, you know? <laughs> no, honestly, uh, he's a brilliant man. Uh, uh, he's a visionary African leader. But if you allow me to do so, my, uh, I would like to express real concern about agriculture in Africa. One is, beside China and India, Africa is the only place in the world that has to feed one billion human beings a day. One billion human beings a day. And if you can do so, like three meals a day. So what it takes for Africa is to really enter the Green Revolution. And uh, I was going to give the examples of like two young Africans who made statements that are very revealing. One young African said this. He was asked why, if you try to cross the, uh, the desert and try to cross uh, the, uh, the, the Mediterranean Sea to go to Europe, you may die. And his reaction was, look at me, I'm already dead. And you cannot die twice. 
so I'm going. The second Afri young African said this, I came from the suburb of Senegal. My parents have been feeding me for 32 years. I, cannot no, I can no longer stay home and be still fed by my parents, so I'm going. If I die in the ocean, that's fine. So just to say how central food is in the history of human beings, we all know it. And I truly believe that if Asia in the uh, 50s and 60s was almost at the same level of Africa uh, than Africa, and today they have solved their problems, most of Asian countries, then Africa should question itself what happened to us, why we can do the same. And then, like just Mustafa said, we have the best potential in terms of water, quality of uh, 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 you know, resources, quality of land, and why we are not getting the most out of it. I truly believe that the, the answer is leadership, number one. Number two, leadership. Number three, leadership. Precisely because at this stage, we have 400 million tons of deficit, food deficit in Africa, almost half a billion. And we have to catch up with the rest of the world and then join the rest of the world in the real debate about agriculture, the future of agriculture. Humanity, from f for 5,000 years of agriculture, has achieved 7 billion tons per year. And now we'll double the population, world population, in 50 years. So in the next 50 years, we have to double food production. So Africa has first to succeed in its green revolution, number one. And number two has to catch, catch up with the rest of the world in this debate about the conceptual uh, 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 revolution going from cereals to uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. So it's a whole debate, and I truly believe that, like all debate, before being scientific or uh, uh, agricultural or economic, it's a political debate. Thank you very much, Doctor. I wanted to ask um, uh, uh, Chairman Tarab, and after this answer, I want to go to the audience to, um, to bring you into this discussion. Uh, going back to the whole question about whether Africa can feed itself without technology, innovation, could you talk to us about what are some of the uh, innovative methods that are, that are being used, even by your own company? Sure, but, but uh, you know, again, uh, Building up on what Gadio said, there's already going to be a huge challenge to feed Africa. And so, one billion today, two billion in 2050. Let's again focus on 2050. But my, the point I was trying to make is that in 2050, it is clear that the rest of the world is going to need Africa to feed itself. So, double challenge. You know, uh, but you know, simply because remaining arable land is there. Uh, ask your, yourselves why land grab happens in Africa. You know, I'm, uh, probably not the right solution, but it, it, it is a recognition that Africa is going to start feeding the rest of the world. Now, again, the, the, the innovation, I would look at it again through the small, small farmer angle. Uh, you, you, we will have to use the right type of technologies for the right type of soils and plants, again, maintaining biodiversity as it exists in Africa. Uh, technology is global, but innovation is very local. So uh, in a sense, the innovation is going to come from the ground. It's going to come from the small farmer. Uh, so the, the idea is that to empower the small farmer from the beginning, and this is what we're trying to do at, at OCP in terms of fertilizer. We are not selling fertilizer in Africa the same way we're doing it in the rest of the world. We start by mapping soil fertility using high tech, then we do soil testing with the farmer to, to make sure we give them the right type of fertilizer at the right time for the right type of soil, what we call the 4R stewardship. So innovation is local. Uh, you have to, it, it comes from the ground. Look, we already had an experience that we're overseeing is the, the mobile revolution in Africa that you know, nobody believed in at the, at the outset, uh, tremendous growth in mobile that if we were honest with ourselves, nobody predicted. At least the, 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 the experts uh, did not predict. But it created a lot of innovation on the way mobile service provision occurs. Uh, and that innovation is now taken out of Africa. Mobile payment, you know, what do they call it? Apple Pay or 
something, you know, recent innovation in the West, started in Kenya 15 years ago. You know, uh, that payment in Kenya, a lot of people are talking about, in fact, um, you have uh, people in Washington, one guy by the name of Bill Gates, is looking at uh, using that more widely, not only in other parts of Africa, but also in the Caribbean and elsewhere. I want to open it up to the audience to um, bring in questions or comments. If I can get a microphone, please. Thank you. We'll start down here, please. If you can, uh, please, uh, if you can rise and um, just give us a, tell us who you are. Thank you. Patrick Worms, I work for an agricultural research organization. I'd like to thank the minister for making the point about the importance of innovation, and you made it too, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we collaborate closely with Embrapa in trying to bring appropriate technologies to African farmers. I'd like you all to look at the picture in the background to the right, which was chosen by the organizers, presumably to illustrate agricultural progress. What you can see is an array of 10 or 12 uh, harvesters operating together, to me, it looks like a picture from a Soviet Union report on the glories of communism from 1956. <laughs> this is not what modern agriculture is. This is what ancient agriculture is. Modern agriculture is far more cognizant of the soil, of the type of fertilizer, the right types of trees, the right type of plants to put in place. It is also far more cognizant of economic factors. That picture on the right is the sort of thing you still see in Ukraine, in the US, and in parts of Brazil, in places where there's very few people and a large amount of capital, because these machines are expensive. Africa has very little capital, but it has a very large number of people, a billion today, two billion in 2050. 80% of those people are smallholder farmers. Helping them to improve their productivity is going to be the key to the success of this continent. Is that a utopia, a pipe dream? No, there is an example, Taiwan. South Korea, Japan, even China, all four of these countries after the Second World War started their breathtaking economic development by breaking up their larger states, giving it to smallholders, and investing heavily in the productivity of these smallholders. Does investing heavily mean more machines, more fertilizer, more pesticides? Not necessarily. It means more knowledge. It means giving these smallholders the right way of utilizing the tools that modern chemistry and that modern mechanization can bring to them in order to better their own circumstances and thus the circumstances of their countries. Those are the models that I am convinced Africa can follow. And if it does that, then I'm sure you're right, Mr. Chairman, by 2050, Africa will feed a substantial part of the world. Exactly. Thank you very much. There's another comment. Uh, my name is Marcus Freitas. I actually have two questions, one from Mr. Mustafa, which is the following. Uh, Brazil, for instance, has had problems with the infrastructure and producing a lot, but some of, the, uh, some of the things are lost due to infrastructure problems. What are some of the things that are Africa, that the African continent is doing to improve its infrastructure in order to make things deliverable, you know, not only the Green Revolution, but effectively using it in the best way it's possible? And the question to Minister Levy is the following. Brazil, for the longest time, has been known as a barn to the world. Brazilians always like to say we'd, we'd love to be the barn of the world and you know, feed the world from Brazil. Now, how can we transition from being a barn to becoming actually a supermarket where we actually add value to the products we sell, not only commodities? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Terrell, you go first. Uh, I, I think I understood your question. Let me answer it this way. Uh, we are trying to use financial instruments. When you talk about infrastructure uh, and, and agricultural growth, they both need investment, they need financing. But we're trying to use financial instruments that are invented and are applied to other circumstances to solve the problem and we're not managing. I mean, the, 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 the amount of finance that's going to agriculture and indeed infrastructure in Africa is, is minimal. Why? Because we, we, we have financial instruments and investors that look at it in a piecemeal manner. You look at an investment, uh, an infrastructure project, and you decide it's not worth financing because the agricultural growth is not there to use the infrastructure project. And then when you look at the agricultural situation, same thing. You say, why should I invest? The infrastructure is lacking. But if you look at them both at the same time, then it is worth the investment, and you have a return on investment. Can we bring holistic investment tools to solve problems that are holistic to start with? There is financial innovation. So the innovation I mentioned before is not just 
in terms of you know, technology, etc. It's also how we organize markets uh, and financing uh, of these markets around Africa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Le Minister Levy? I, I would answer your question, uh, taking a point from, uh, from um, uh, his answer. Um, the success of agriculture in Brazil is also linked to the institutions and what you finance. A lot of things are integrated. For instance, a large part of small farmers actually are part of value chain. Uh, we call it now the protein chain, but uh, let's say poultry uh, is also a way to call it. It, it starts from the guy who who um, have the corn plantation, and then it goes to, to, to raising, and then it goes to huge uh, industrial, and then has the infrastructure because you have to export. And we have achieved, and you have to have some credit throughout the, cha the, the, the chain. And in Brazil, uh, the success of agriculture is also linked to some credit policies. They are sometimes expensive, uh, but they are absolutely necessary. I think that uh, in Africa, you would have to find ways, for instance, to finance the small farmer. Uh, it's, it's tricky. You need to have the, the financial institutions on the ground. In Brazil, you have, uh, well, mainly uh, Banco do Brasil, but you have other banks who are there. And they, and they have the experience, and, and, and uh, they also help with the dissemination of innovation, and, and they, they adjust as new technologies come. So I, th I think to have this institutional infrastructure, you be uh, absolutely uh, necessary, because it's the way also to give the instruments for the, the small farmers. And it also works for the large farmer. I mean, someone has to finance uh, when he uses these big machines. And, uh, and again, you have to have some, uh, uh, some framework to organize that. So these, I think, are worthwhile discussion, and you have to see what will be the role of the, the, the state or not. In Brazil, agriculture is uh, a private sector uh, activity. All of these, big and small, are basically uh, entrepreneurs. They do have the support of the state in terms of some policy stability, some credit policies that have a fundamental uh, role with the private sector together, but often you need. And then, of course, the support for the dissemination of innovation, training, and so on and so forth. So I think in every place, I mean, if you look at the US 100 years ago, it's the same. You have to have this combination of institutions, sometimes with the help of foreigners, is a bit what we were, again, what you mentioned, we we're trying to do in Mozambique. So you have the local institution together with, with uh, Brazil, with uh, Japan, probably other partners, to, to create this ecosystem. Um, and, and, and in Brazil also, like you mentioned, we also at some point had help in specific things from uh, external people, and, and that makes a successful uh, recipe. Now, to go beyond, to go to additional things, we are already moving that. In the last 10 years, uh, we have done what uh, is absolutely necessary. Because of the way trade is organized, too, you have to go to your uh, market, and you have to establish yourself in that market, and then you start to have the control of the whole uh, chain, even in simple things. I mean, uh, uh, the largest employer in North Ireland today is a Brazilian company. It happens to be in the meat uh, uh, sector, the, the, again, protein, let's call them. Uh, it's a Brazilian company who had bought uh, Irish companies in North Ireland uh, and it's the largest one. And because Brazil is a free market, actually even the ownership of this company has moved because of, uh, of uh, anti-monopoly uh, reasons back in Brazil. But it, it's clear that the way to, to go up in this ladder is uh, to go to the final country. Because otherwise, as we all know, uh, in many countries, uh, the, the commodity has a low tax. If you do a little bit of processing, you have steep taxes. This is what happens in, in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. This is what happens in China. So it's not by chance that sometimes you're a little bit stuck in, in the commodities. Because when you try to go uh, in next steps, and this, I think, uh, has some lessons to, to, to Africa later. It will be important to look at that. Uh, you, you find some obstacles, barriers. Um, so one way to, to convert them is we, 
to go and to, to, to buy, to investment. So you, uh, trade and investment is more and more linked. So a way to avert some of these trade barriers that ex still exist, exist in Europe and in, somewhere, in some places, also in Asia, uh, is to go there, to be there, and then you have the whole chain and you can improve. Uh, it's clear that... Uh, thank you, thank you very, uh, the, very much, that's the way. Mr. Minister. Unfortunately, we've got to move on. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ludovic Suan. I'm an economist. I, I would really like to hear our panelists about the use of policies. Uh, you know, I, if I think about the farm bill in the U.S., the common agricultural policy in Europe, Africa has been tiptoeing with very heavily subsidized agriculture sector and very liberalized one. I think about the Malawis, the Ethiopias of the world that used to be poster child for famine and today can actually feed their own people. Where do you stand on, on this issue? Uh, it's the same for cash crop. I think about the peanut sector in Senegal. I think about the famine that uh, touched uh, Niger, while Nigeria nearby in 2005 was actually having the food, uh, the entitlement issue. Where do you stand on this debate today? Where, where, should there be a heavily subsidized agricultural sector for African countries? Should that be the answer? I mean, at least in the short run, to make sure that technology arrives and the private sector crowds in? I, I, that's my question. Mr. President, do you want to start that answer? Well, Thank you. Well, I believe that the policy direction in Africa should be what is now known as uh, sustainable agriculture, which means agriculture that takes care of the health of the soils, the environment, and the ecosystem. And um, for me, that should be our policy. Uh, I will not worry too much at this stage about the use of fertilizer because in Africa we are about, what, 14 kg per hectare yes. compared with Asia, which is over 120 per hectare. So we are not anywhere near there. Um, and I will not uh, at this stage say, look, don't use fertilizer if fertilizer is what we need to improve the soil and uh, keep the health of the soil, uh, ensure biodiversity, ensure ecosystem, um, I, I, will, I will use this. Now, if uh, what we are also saying is, uh, look, the other part of technology uh, which some people are worried about, I, I, I would rather take the ability to feed uh, uh, the world, to feed Africa as primary concern. And of course, uh, within what we know of the effect or the uh, implication of technology at this point in time. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm, sorry, I'm going to take uh, moderator's prerogative and try to go, because there are a no number of hands throughout the room. There's another one here. Um, Dominique, I'm a former diplomat in, uh, French diplomat in Morocco. Uh, I think we all share the idea that putting the small shareholder as a center is the key for innovation, as Mustafa Terab said, also for taking care of the soil, etc. But it depends on the product. Uh, you can't have this kind of pattern with every product. Some more previous speaker said that in the Middle West of the US, you had a kind of Soviet Union type agriculture. Is it because all Americans are communists? I don't think so. It's because grain, um, grain um, needs a capital intensive techniques. Rice is exactly the opposite. For botanic reasons, with rice, you need, if you um, take care, a lot of care of the plant every day, looking at the soil, uh, looking how water is trickling down, it will increase productivity. So rice has taught China the importance of small order and the importance of giving small holders uh, the means to product. And the same with wine in France. Wine is exactly the same. And this has led to putting the farmer, the little farmer at the center. But I think we need both, so the, I think one of the questions for agricultural policy is to combine and to find an equilibrium between 
um, putting importance on small orders, giving importance to, to products that deserve that, and on the other hand, having some share for big farms. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Gadio, would you like to address that? Yes, uh, actually. Uh, if you, let me just take one second to tell everyone that um, you can see across on both sides of the screen, uh, people are commenting, and that's another way to get engaged in the conversation because we might not be able to get to all of you, but uh, that's one way so that everyone can uh, see your thoughts. I'm sorry, doctor. No, the idea of uh, small farmers and smallholders being given a, a privilege. We have a, an interesting case in Africa, uh, which is uh, Cote d'Ivoire back in the 60s. That country was doing very, very well. And we were talking about the ivory and miracle. And Ofwet Bwanyi was a president who was uh, very much dedicated to the uh, farmers. And he did a lot for his uh, uh, people. And Cote d'Ivoire was doing so well that at the time, you know, uh, one million, almost one million Senegalese people moved to Cote d'Ivoire. And so many West Africans moved to Cote d'Ivoire because the country was doing very well with agriculture. But what happened? International institutions came to tell Cote d'Ivoire that you, you should stop subsidizing your small farmers. You, they are, you should let them become adults. Now, people who were saying that were subsidizing agriculture back home. One billion dollar uh, in the US per day, and same thing in Europe. Like in France, they subsidize, they help their agriculture. 10% of the French people are taking care of agriculture, and they are a European superpower, you know, in terms of agriculture. Senegal, you take many African countries, 60% 60, 60 of the people may be working in the agricultural sector. And just to yield like 30% or 20% of the GDP, the country's GDP. So that, that, that's a real problem that we need to address. Now, the other problem, uh, because I'm saying it, I'm a Pan-Africanist. I truly believe that 54 African states, Balkanized African states, and the Balkanization of Africa is ongoing, is even accelerating. They separated South Sudan. They were interested in separated Azawad. So if we go that way, we will end up with 100 African states, and all those small entities cannot take care of all developmental issues at once. They cannot take care of infrastructure, education, agriculture, health, energy, environment, ITC, all those uh, developmental issues, we need to put our resources together. We need to put our sovereignties together to build like regional policies or continental policies. When a, a, a rural farmer in Niger does a good job in producing, and then he has no way of selling his production, or if they try to send their production to the you know, countries that have a seaport, and then you have to go through 10 or 15, you know, uh, control checkpoint, people trying to get money out of your, you know, your trucks, and then you end up being completely, uh, you know, broke. Or, and we have, we do have uh, uh, regional policies in regional economic communities, but people do not apply them at the local level or in, in our roads and everything. So my thing is we have to integrate our agriculture. The first sovereignty of a nation is to be able to feed your people. Food security is a major act of sovereignty. You cannot like make Senegal work the whole year and make $1 billion as a surplus and take it all to China, Pakistan, and Vietnam, buying food to bring back to our people, while we can do it at home. Thank you very much. Another one is energy security, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later this afternoon with some real examples along the lines of what you were talking about earlier. Gentlemen, please. Hello, <clears throat> John Wilkinson. I'm a, a, a British Brazilian from uh, 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 living in Brazil and at the uh, Rural University in, in Rio de Janeiro. I'd like to talk a, a little bit about the institutional and regulatory challenges and not just the focus on, on technology in, in relation to agricultural policy. In Brazil, on, we've had a twofold uh, policy, as the minister has explained, one orientated to family farming and the other to large scale agriculture. We've had 20 years of a policy of strengthening the family farm in Brazil. There are something like 4.5 million uh, small properties in Brazil. After 20 years of a very uh, uh, strong program, which has grown 
uh, continuously during this period, we have something like 600,000 small farmers who are now integrated autonomously into the market. That leaves over 3 million who are not. There are 2 million who uh, can possibly make that transition. But there are at least 2 million recognized uh, today, which will be either the object of social policies, the uh, object of agrarian reform, or the object of migration to the rural areas. So the whole question of, of agriculture has got to be seen in, in a broader context, and it has extraordinarily strong institutional challenges. Our experience of re agrarian reform is very strong, as well as being involving something like uh, 20 million farmers uh, during this period. But the results are very limited because you need enormous institutional resources to reconstitute agriculture in, in different circumstances. So you have a, a, a huge uh, challenge that any increase in productivity and promotion, you will have a whole area of marginal producers and producers who have insufficient resources to deal with that. And therefore, uh, it's not simply technology, but a whole range of other institutional policies and regulatory policies. Just finally, not to extend too much, on the side of the large-scale agriculture, uh, looking at this picture and taking up uh, uh, what was previously said. In fact, Embrapa has a policy which is not diametrically opposed, but quite solidly opposed to that model, and that the large-scale model today should not be monoculture, but should be an integration of livestock, uh, forestry, and crops. It's not having much success with that at the moment. And uh, what we seem to be exporting, perhaps, to Mozambique is a model which we no longer uh, uh, defend in policy terms in, in Brazil. So I think we need to think about the, the, the regulatory, the institutional challenges involved in uh, 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 promoting agricultural development uh, in Africa, not simply the, the questions of innovation and technology. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let's, now, there's clearly a lot of interest, and I encourage you to continue to comment on SpotMe. Helga Flores Trejo with the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, now, 2008, we had a global food crisis that it showed, in my opinion, two things. One, how quickly price hikes in food led to social unrest from places to Haiti, from Haiti to Egypt. And second, that the global response, instead of being one of cooperation, was one of export restrictions, etc., that exacerbated the problem. So, Chairman Terab, I want to ask you, what have we learned? since 2008. Did we learn something? Are we better prepared now to face such a thing? Uh, you, you authorize me to answer? Oh, absolutely. Or you want to pick up? Uh, no, no, uh, please, Mr. Chairman, please. Uh, well, wh what we have learned is that these issues are not simple, and but that simple answers to these issues, I would say even populist answers to these issues, can create more problems than solve. You know, the, the issue of uh, prices, I'll, I'll, tr I'll be co controversial here, the issue of food prices, you know, to, to which, uh, w w what is really the impact of low or high food prices on the, on, the, on the African farmer? If we look at the farmer and the necessity to produce that food before consuming it, uh, you really can pose the question of, pricing and how pricing is, uh, is built up along the value chain. Who really benefits along the value chain and we get into fair trade and trade issues, etc. But I think a global, you know, I heard interesting things on subsidies. You know, each one of these questions, by the way, use of technology, the, the balance between large scale and, uh, and, and small farming and indeed subsistence farming, each one merits uh, a debate on its own, so it's very difficult to... But, uh, again, building on the same idea that we should not be too simple in our thinking and not too populist, even the, 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 the subsidy issue, if you look at it, why is subsidy a dirty word? 
because economists think that we have a, a functioning market and subsidies come in and distort the market. So it's not good. But the, 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 the agricultural market in, in Africa is a history of market failures. We have market failure. We have to build the market before deciding that subsidies are a dirty word. You know, and subsidies sometimes are needed to build the market. What we have is market failures. The small farmer in Africa cannot export or cannot have, does not have access to, to farming. In fact, the, 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 you know, 60, in some areas, 60 to 80 percent of homegrown products die because they rot, because the, the, the access of market to market is so difficult. Okay, so <coughs> subsidies sometimes can help actually go to market. And there's the big hypocrisy, I will call it, of subsidies, you know, lecturing Africans on subsidies. And by the way, we're talking about very minute subsidies, okay? When you have common agricultural policies that are massive subsidies that really distort the market and, and, and trade, I think we have to reflect on that uh, seriously. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. There's another question. Yes. Thank you very much, starting by a suggestion to the organizer. Next time, please put a lady on the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, that? in Africa, 70% of the food that feed household is produced by women. Mm -hmm. And this is said by a very serious organization, mm -hmm. FAO. Mm -hmm. So there is no way in Africa we're going to solve the issue of agriculture if we don't address gender issues within policies. And it's very concrete. You do have the majority of the agricultural workers who are women with no education, no access to resources, no access to land. So how are you going to develop the sector without addressing those key issues? My question is for the four gentlemen on the floor. Thank you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Can, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Minister, can you please answer? Well, in Brazil, the Minister of Agriculture is a woman, <laughs> and she has been a leader in her field for many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's uh, really an important issue, and uh, one that is, uh, we try to address in, in Brazil. And uh, I think from what we hear, it's true. Education <coughs> is, is key. Having the people who are on the ground to understand what it takes to get more productive is uh, fundamental. And I just would complete that, uh, yes, this transition of having an agriculture where you have rotation of, uh, of uh, cultures, where you have also, also cattle ranching, which was a problem in Brazil, integrated. What I mentioned, the low carbon agriculture is fundamental to ensure the sustainability of the model, both for small as well as for big farmers. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. We only have a few minutes left, but we'll uh, take um, a question here to talk about, I guess, yes. the, small, the small island states. Yes, um, Caroline Alexis Thomas from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, this couple points. How do we protect um, traditional livelihood, um, especially in small island states where we saw the demise of our coconut industry to the rise of the soya bean industry? Um, I want to follow on the previous question and the role of women as being a strategic partner in this exercise where women are now around the table and not on the menu card as we heard about last night, as well as how are we going forward with the uh, protecting industries with the um, genetically modified seeds that we're hearing about. If we can get an answer to just one of those questions, and uh, uh, Mr. President, do you want to uh, tackle any of those? Well, let, let me come up to, first of all, to the issue of women. Um, to ignore the role of women in African agriculture particularly um, is to uh, ignore um, the vital part of agricultural development or what I now call a great business in, in Africa. Uh, the, the women, um, they are major uh, role player, uh, uh, key uh, players in 
agriculture, both in production, in marketing, in distribution, and even in semi-local processing. Um, uh, that, 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 that's the first uh, point I want to make. The, the second point um, about uh, smallholders uh, versus uh, um, large scale. In fact, I describe, I, I partition uh, practitioners in Africa into three. There are the smallholders, the medium holders, or the medium um, uh, sized farmers, and those I call commercial farmers, like we have in Brazil. Now, I, I believe the attention, most of our attention should be paid to the smallholders and the medium sized uh, farmers, those who have five hectares, 10 hectares, and maximum, not more than 20 hectares. Now, I think they need attention, and they are the ones that uh, really will develop and provide employment that we need in agriculture, uh, rather than the commercial farmer who will bring heavy equipment and uh, do damage, uh, not only to, this, uh, to the soil, but do damage to uh, uh, water and environment and biodiversity, but particularly the amount of employment that they generate is minimal compared with the amount of employment that the small and uh, uh, medium-sized farmers generate. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Some good news. Uh, the time gods have just given us a little bit more time. So there's a question. Thank you. If you can stand up, please. Thank you, Nay Bechili. I have a quick question about land titles. And Ananda de Seto, a famous, famous economist from Peru, mentioned that there is no possibility for economic development without land titles. What is being done in your part of the world for that? Because we have been talking about agriculture, green revolution, but this is a crucial issue we need to tackle. Doctor? Uh, from what I know, um, uh, uh, generally speaking, like in, in um, one of the debate we have about land title and land issues, I think Senegal is interested in working on land title and trying to solve the problem. But, you know, as I reflect always uh, in terms of Africa, uh, I know that uh, a few world superpowers are coming to Africa to buy land. And I know two countries, I don't want to mention their name for now, but we have to be fully aware that that's a particular issue, people coming to buy piece of land in Africa. And I, I agree with her, we need to work on that particular issue of title. If you allow me to say two words on two issues that should not go uh, and dealt with. One is irrigation in Africa. When you have the 20 number, uh, 21st con uh, like countries that are doing excellent, uh, you know, when it comes to irrigation, you don't have like one or two African countries. That's a problem that we need to solve because you cannot do agriculture without irrigation. And then the value chain, still producing crop and just exporting it as is. We need to have, uh, to develop all this strategy of value chains to show Africans that agriculture is not only to feed people, it is important to feed people, but Afri agriculture brings also jobs and creates jobs. And the other thing that uh, agriculture does, like one of my great friend, uh, great researcher on agriculture, is to free time for people to do development, to do art, to do culture, to do other things. If you wake up every day and your only problem is to run around and to find food to feed yourself, you will not contribute to the development of your country and you will not even contribute to your own development because your only problem is to find food and to eat. So for that reason, we should also tell people, uh, African people, that it is high time that we know all the interests uh, that we have in developing agriculture in our continent. Please. Thank you. Uh, Jaime Nogueira Pinto from Portugal. I'm a professor of political science. I also have some investments in Africa and mainly in Mozambique. Well, my, my question was partially answered because it was exactly uh, about how property titles, the, the communal ownership of land in some countries in Africa, uh, how it is 
difficult for, for some investors to have, well, I'd say for industrial agriculture mainly, the difficulties that are raised by different uh, local property, traditional, uh, all that sort of thing that I see sometimes being an obstacle for, for investment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, is there anyone here from Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe? Uh, are you from Zimbabwe? Oh, okay. I'll, uh, I'll come back to you in a second, but I just want to, uh, this gentleman has been waiting for a while. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo Valadão. Uh, I would like to take a contrarian view, as always. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical about prioritizing the very small landowner or small uh, farmer. For one reason, if you look at Africa now, in 20 years' time, most of Africa population will be living in cities. There's a huge urban revolution in Africa going there. And this revolution is not only for economic reasons. We all know that the life of a small farmer is very harsh, is very monotonous, is very complicated. And now everybody's connected. Everybody has television. Everybody can see what's happening in the world. So young people, most young people, don't want to stay on the farm to have this kind of life. They want to go to the cities. They want to, to, to have more freedom, to have more uh, the, the, this thing. So we are, it's a sociological problem uh, on, uh, on that side, because people don't live only to eat. People live to eat and a lot of other things. And I would like to, to finish that with uh, a say that one of Brazil's main producers of, of samba schools used to say when people criticized the fact that you had a lot of people in the street with beautiful things that cost a lot of money. And he said, look, poor people love luxury. It's the intellectuals that love poverty. Uh, so I, I think we should also put in the equation the sociological and psychological problem. Every, everywhere in the world, when things get better, people leave the countryside. Uh, so I'm not sure that prioritizing for in the long run, maybe in the short run, but in the long run, prioritizing the small farm will solve the problem. Because the real problem is to have affordable food, not to have food, affordable food. If your food is too expensive, you won't feed anybody, and you won't make a, a good life for the peasant. Thank you. Mr. President? Well, I don't want this to be um, a dialogue between us, but um, a situation where you have or you deliberately allow urban migration is fraught with danger. It's fraught with danger because then you have high crime rate in the urban area. You have the rural area deserted. My own idea, and it has worked, is to take those things that the young men want in the urban area, take it to them in the uh, rural area. They want light. They want water bone, uh, they want pipe bone water. They want road. Now, these can be taken to them and make them remain they want school for their children. They want, they want health uh, uh, care um, delivery uh, service. Now, there's no earthly reason why you cannot do this and keep them substantially in the rural area and do uh, and be producers, and in fact, uh, heavy producers, whether they are small uh, scale or medium scale farmers. But if you say you don't pay attention in terms of taking to them what will make them live comfortably, and in fact, um, not worried much about uh, the uh, urban area, then we are in danger. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Levy? Very shortly, two things. First, of course, and I've been reading some of the comments, uh, yeah, Brazil is a country, although a country with a lot of diversity, and uh, Africa, 
you always have to deal with the thing that's the continent, like Europe is a continent, Latin America, but then there is the identity of individual countries. Mm -hmm. But of course, when you're united, you're stronger on when you think as a whole, often you also get good results. But perhaps uh, responding to the issue of Mr. Valadão, I think there's a balance there. And in Brazil, we live through a huge uh, migration to cities, which actually is coming back. And if you look at the last uh, 10 years, we can grant that there's a special uh, situation where you have the commodity booms and so on. Actually, you have seen uh, uh, coming back, uh, people coming back to small and medium-sized cities. And you get even indicators. For instance, uh, now you live longer in the countryside than in the cities. And uh, you see this kind of uh, transformation that President is saying. I mean, a lot of these cities now get, uh, uh, I mean, people get mobility. We sell motorcycles by, by the millions. Why? Because in these small cities, everyone uh, wants some sort of mobility. The motorcycle is what is affordable. And they, of course, they get uh, uh, TV and they get now uh, cable and so on. So I think. It's, it's, it's a gradual uh, thing to bring this. It's expensive sometimes to bring. We still are, for instance, uh, uh, high-speed internet is a big challenge for us because it's so big, so how to get everywhere. Uh, but uh, yes, we can bring things. You can make the life in small uh, cities and in countryside much closer uh, with that in big cities. And uh, big cities have their own problems, criminality and so, so many other things. <coughs> so I think agriculture can provide uh, a stability in, in, in this area. I don't know all the details of Africa. I'm just uh, sharing experience of my own country. Doesn't need necessarily to apply to everybody. Thank you. This gentleman's been waiting for a while. Please, please stand. So, thank you. Uh, I'm Song Qing from China, and uh, currently a research fellow at one uh, think tank in China. Um, I think just now we uh, majority of the participants here agree that Africa can feed the rest of the world. That means um, green revolution in Africa is not a uh, regional issue anymore. It's part of global issue. So it's part of global uh, governance. I think for the global governance issues, policymakers should pay, play a very important role. But in the meantime, in meantime um, think tank also play a very important role. And now we are having not only G20, but also T20, that means Think Tank 20. Um, and <laughs> policymakers and the Think Tank need to be concerted and <coughs> complementary each other in um, meeting the global challenges. So um, my quick, uh, quick question for all of you, that is, um, I've, I'm sure that in your pro professional life, you have more or less connection to Think Tanks. So, uh, from your personal point of view, what kind of um, role think tanks should play, could play a platform organizing such an impeccable conference? So <laughs> again, thanks for the organization of GMF and the OCP Policy Center. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, that's your lane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you also in a, a different venue asked the question about, uh, you know, how to solve uh, some global, and I think we were mentioning security at the time, uh, issues uh, and global organizations uh, can, can deal with this. Uh, and, and again, if I go back to what Mr. Valado said, uh, um, th there is a strong, uh, you know, if, if security is a global issue also, then if only for that reason, we should pay attention to the small uh, holder. Uh, you know, uh, br bringing more life, uh, you know, more wealth and uh, in, indeed prosperity to the smallholder should be, in Africa should be priority given cur today's current uh, uh, c current situation. Um, and uh, and also, but this could become a research project. You know, M Morocco is mainly rent-fed agriculture, so when there is a drought, we see massive exodus to the cities. But when, when there is rain, we see the reverse exodus. So it is not necessarily a one way. There is attractiveness from the rural areas if conditions are, mm. are there. So you know, again, we can build the infrastructure and, and make it more attractive. But look, we, if we agree that, uh, and again, my point is that is not that 
we have a choice is uh, Africa will have to, to feed the world. It's, there's no choice in 20, if you, you know, if you look at the numbers. And therefore, it's a glo as you rightly said, it's a global issue. Where is Africa represented in global governance mechanism? You know, so we're talking about policy issues, we're talking about regulation, but where is Africa represented? You, you, yesterday, I didn't want the quick answer to you because you said security, Africa. Is Africa any African country member of the Security Council? While we ponder that question, we'll take a question from over here. Please. So I wanted Did to build on, uh, uh, Estelle Yusuf, I'm a journalist. I wanted to build on, on uh, Dr. Tarab's comment. Um, I'm actually, as well, very bullish on Africa being uh, the next barn for, for the world. We don't have a choice. I think the question is not about if, it's how and when. And when you talk about uh, G20 meetings, about agriculture, I, I've been following them as a journalist, and you had India, which is often the voice, and Brazil, which are often the voice of uh, South country and Africa, South con countries and Africa, asking for transfers of technology, because we're talking about what is necessary and imperative for Africa to meet this challenge. It's technology, it's not just about education. Education is the first step, but then it's R&D. And when uh, the, the second topic that you touched on was uh, global warming, CO2 emissions, a quarter of them, come from agriculture. That's the next big challenge. My worry is that Africa will be not only imposed on feeding the planet, but also feeding the planet sustainably, which are two uh, big uh, questions. How can Africa become the, the barn, but a sustainable barn without access to technology? And how can Africa lobby for that access? Who wants to tackle that question? I, I can, but I think the president answered before. You know, you, we're holding Africa accountable to standards at a moment where it needs to develop uh, and it needs some flexibility. You know, whether it applies to what you just said, but also in, uh, you know global warming, and uh, we'll see what happens in Paris. But the commitments that are asked for African countries who are suffering the most, by the way, by what the others are producing, this is, this is ridiculous. So before. Uh, before asking, you know, uh, efforts from Africa, let's consider at which development stage it is. Okay. We have a question over here, but before, the, are there any emerging uh, leaders in the room? Any yes. emerging leaders? Okay, anyone with a question? Okay, we'll, we'll get you next. Uh, right after this gentleman right here, please. Thank you very much. Actually, I think my question might end up linking with one of the, what one of the emerging leaders uh, would have um, said. Let me join uh, with the former Prime Minister of Senegal in also stating that it would be really good to see one of the young people on the panel because they really represent the future of agriculture. Now, going further, President Obasanjo began to answer my question slightly, but I think we need to go a bit deeper into it. How do you make agricultural cool? And when it, there has to be a cool factor, so to speak. In Africa today, um, I heard a recent uh, 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 documentary on the BBC where there was a young man, he's from a rural family, his parents put all the money together, sent him to school, he graduated and got a job in the banking sector. And then he resigned to become a farmer. And his parents almost disowned him because everybody still thought there was something wrong. Today, as a Nigerian, I'm on a plane, I can hear, I, I can see movies made by Nigerians. Um, anywhere, I hear music being made by young Nigerians. But I've never been anywhere and I've seen anything said with made in Nigeria, made by young people. So my question perhaps can be answered probably by President Obasanjo, but I'd also like to hear from the Brazilian experience. How do you make agriculture cool? How do you make it something that a young person aspires to? And President Obasanjo did something once. They asked him, who are you, at a different panel. He didn't say I'm the former president of Nigeria. He said I'm a farmer. And when you begin to see a former president who introduces himself as a farmer, then young people can start seeing role models of who uh, a farmer can be. Thank you very much. Thank you. But before well, the farmer <laughs> answers, <laughs> before the farmer answers, well, 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 let me just deal with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a true story. 
Um, a friend of mine in Canada invited me. And I got the day mixed up. So I got to Canada a day before uh, he was expecting me. And I had my ordinary passport. So when I got to Canada and uh, going through immigration, they said, look, who are you? I say, I'm a farmer from Nigeria. A farmer from Nigeria? What have you come here for? I say, I come to see a friend. A farmer from Nigeria? Come all the way from Nigeria to see a friend in Canada? Okay, come this side. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, then the, 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 the questioning uh, went on. Eventually, I gave the name of my friend, and um, I said, look, could I phone him? They allowed me to phone him, and he came. And uh, after about three hours, I got out of uh, the immigration. Um, and then when we came out, he said, look, how did you introduce yourself? I said, I introduced myself as a farmer from Nigeria. Oh, he said, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You should have said you are in uh, agribusiness. They will have opened the door for you. <laughs> now, no, 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 wait. So, I had a son who read electronics in Cambridge, England. He had a PhD, and he was going to MIT to teach. So I said, look, come to Nigeria on your way to uh, the U.S., and, um, but bring all your uh, luggage. So he came, and I said, look, why don't you join me on the farm? He said, Daddy, me join you on the farm? It took me seven years to get a PhD in electronics. Join you on the farm? No. <laughs> anyway, I persuaded him. And um, he joined me. After about six months, he seemed to be liking it. And we were on the farm together. So one day, I told this story of uh, my experience in, in Canada. And after that, day, uh, uh, after that day, he said, look, Daddy, you are a farmer. I am in a great business. <laughs> 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 well, we, we have to find a way of attracting young people into agriculture. And um, the... Uh, I think um, uh, God will talk about uh, the value chain, um, the processing and all that. So we, 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 we must take them, we must make young people, men and women, see agriculture in a different light. And as you rightly said, now look, the young people will rather go into uh, rapping. Uh, if he's a rapper, he makes a lot of money. So, uh, he, he will be making music, which means nothing. It means nothing to me. Uh, but he makes money. And then uh, uh, another story. <laughs> One of our state governors was campaigning. And he went and said, look, when I become state governor, I will pay attention to agriculture. And all these people who are riding motorcycles and they're uh, using motorcycles as taxis, I will get them out of the way and um, they will go to farm. So the, in the evening, the uh, motorcycle riders went to him and said, if you want to be governor, stop this nonsense of you saying you will get rid of motorcycle riders because you won't get there. He never talked about motorcycle riders again in his campaign. He became governor, and he couldn't do anything about them. Mm. Now, we have to find a way of really getting young men and young uh, women into agriculture. My son remains a, an agribusiness. I remain a farmer. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you very much, Mr. President. Unfortunately, we're just about out of time, but we'll take, uh, looking to the future, we'll, uh, we'll get the last question or comment from one of the emerging leaders, and then we'll wrap up. And you feel free whether you want to uh, tackle her question or comment as you wrap up, but please. Yes, uh, my name is Nerese Dockery, and I'm from St. Kitts and Nevis, and I'm one of the emerging leaders. Um, I am taking a completely outsider view to this conversation to some degree, but I, I would like to share with you just a perspective that we can give from the Caribbean region, given our history of regional integration at the CARICOM level, as well as at the, the level of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Um, what we recognize is that when it comes to, there are many, many challenges facing the world. And we recognize that Africa is a, an a essential part of that solution. Where is the African Union in all this? Because on these larger issues, it is, they can only be properly solved in a comprehensive way that impacts lives and changes things if it is addressed in a collective fashion. There's strength through unity. Where is the leadership coming from the African Union to set comprehensive policies in place? Because we recognize that the African continent is diverse. Each country has its unique situations and circumstances and conditions. And the only way that you can address this issue is if you take a regional approach in which you assess the, 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 all of the policies possibilities across the continent, you divide the work, you divide who will produce what. So at the end of the day, not only are people fed, but people are able to make, to maximize the potential in agriculture because your economies become integrated in a way that allows you to feed each other so you're not net competitors with each other and you are able to feed the world. Um, I just, um, I'm just a little bit dismayed at the level of timidity in the leadership in the African community, especially as they engage the rest of the world. It's just a lot of excuses. What is the G20 doing? Oh, they're saying this about us, and they're, they're, they're putting these limitations. We recognize that each of the G20 countries are sitting at the table wanting to come and engage in Africa. It is time Africa had its own policies that it can approach these countries, or when they approach them, to say, here is what we are doing. Here is what we would like you to contribute. Here is how we would like you to invest to meet our priorities, or also, here here is what we would like to trade off with you um, for, 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 for in exchange for your access, we would like to have market access and for you to change your policies regarding subsidization of farming and all that stuff. These are the things that Africa can negotiate from a position of strength. It has the bargaining power. This is Africa's moment. And I am just very just flabbergasted as, as was discussed in the, in, in the night owl session last night. Africa is no longer in a situation where it's on the menu and it's also feeding and serving everybody who's sitting at the table, sitting back. Africa is in a position where it is now sitting at the table and it has the, the power to send out invitations. So it's time that we see that confidence among the leadership in Africa in which they engage the rest of the world from that position of strength and confidence. Okay, thank you very much. Now, as we wrap, Dr. Gadio, we'll start with you. Yes. It's uh, Africa's moment. You can answer that or yes. uh, your no, prepared statement. I, I love everything that I heard from this uh, sister from the, the African diaspora. Uh, she, she, she put it absolutely uh, in, in, in the right terms. Um, when you have a, a, a negotiation between Europe and Africa in uh, dealing with agriculture, um, not Europe, let's say France or whatever country, uh, China, India, they will send one minister of agriculture. Africa will send 54 ministers of agriculture in the same room. Same thing with trade. There was a time China and Europe had a problem. They sent this uh, 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 Mr. Mendelssohn or something. He went to China. He brought all the weight of the, the entire European Union and he spoke to the Chinese government and they found a solution call the same meeting with Africa, they will send 54 trade ministers surrounding one Chinese trade minister, and the Chinese trade minister become the majority. He's the boss. He has 54 African trade ministers around him. So what I'm trying to say is, which is very obvious, united, we are strong. Africa can only have a great destiny, a great future. Africa can only feed the world if you think Africa as a continent with a global strategy. We were trying, working on a project in Mali, in the Delta. We were able to uh, get like a program, agricultural program, but the only way to make it profitable was to like work on 100,000 hectares of rice. If the project was for West Africa, 
then it is profitable. If it's only for Mali, you spend like billions of dollars and it's not profitable. Same thing with the dam we wanted to have in Guinea, Swapiti, to produce electricity. It's <coughs> extremely profitable if it's for the entire West African region. If it's only for Guinea, it's too much, the investment is too high, and the rate of return will not be good enough. So sometimes, it's not a matter of ideology or, or ideal thinking, it's a matter of being realistic. You cannot have one billion human beings, among which 60% are young people. And make those young people, instead of making them an asset, you make them a problem for you, because you don't have the right policy. Africa can only survive. African Renaissance is only possible if we are a united Africa. Thank you very Thank you. much, Mr. May, may I come in, please? May I come in? Um, I, I thank uh, the, the lady who raised this issue. But the situation is not quite as bad, with all due respect. At the turn of the century, the first thing that we realized in Africa is that the OAU that served us to the end of the 20th century would not serve us in the 21st century. So on our own, we changed from OAU to AU. And the constitutive act of the AU was markedly different from the charter of OAU. That was the first thing that we did. The second thing that we did is we brought something we call NEPAD, New Partnership. New Partnership for Africa Development. And the emphasis was on partnership. Partnership inside each country, partnership within sub-regions of Africa, partnership within Africa, and partnership between Africa and the rest of the world. So when we, and the sort of thing we were saying then, and we even went, we had a South American yes. Africa, yes. Um, because we see partnership in that. Now, from NEPAD, the African went for Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program, CADIP, which is meant to coordinate, to work together, to, uh, and they have brilliant uh, objectives, including spending 10% of our budget on agriculture. Now, this was in 2003. And CADIP had achieved some significant progress. Not only do the ministers of agriculture meet and, and talk, they even take issues like fishery, they take issues like special commodities, and talk about them and come to uh, one uh, objective, one aim. Now, it, it is a problem. And the problem is that when you are dealing with those whose power, those are greater than yours, you have a problem. We have something now that Europe is trying to put on us. What do they call that? EPA? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. EPA, which means that we uh, must open our door and everything to them, and they say they will open ours to, uh, to us. But what means do we have to compete with them? What means do we really have when the cost of energy in our place is high, when we cannot be allowed to subsidize and they subsidize? I talk about Hofu Boyen, and I will uh, end on this. President Hofu Boyen built two sugar factories. Those sugar factories are lying waste. And before he died, he was being forced to pay for them. What happened was that his sugar, which he produced, he could not sell because sugar produced in Europe from sugar beet 
is being sub heavily subsidized and being dumped in uh, Côte d'Ivoire. And each time I met him, he was complaining. Now, how do I borrow money to build these factories? And now you are dumping your sugar in my country. I cannot sell my sugar. I have to close my uh, in, uh, industry. And yet you want me to pay back. And that is the type of situation that we find ourselves in. Whether it's agriculture, it's trade, or whatever we are talking about. So, but there is power in our working together. And we have seen that when NEPAD came as a program of Africa. We met in Kananaskis in Canada, and the G7 endorsed NEPAD. And uh, maybe we should do more of that. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, we have just uh, literally run out of time, but I want to give uh, Dr. Tarab and uh, Chair, uh, uh, Mr. Minister Levy an opportunity to close. So we'll start with the chairman, please. Uh, well, uh, I learned in my life to follow what smart people did, and my friend Gadio is very smart. <laughs> so I'll, I'll defer. My, my last comments were exactly, uh, it's just supporting what the young lady that spoke last from the floor said. But I will take it a bit further in terms of, you know, how are we talking about these issues? And we had complaints that on the representativeness of this panel, both in terms of gender and, and age, uh, but uh, and we've tried, you know, to make GM the the Atlantic dialogues with our friend from GMF a bit different, and we've succeeded to a certain extent in that the last session I is uh, entirely given to the what we call emerging leaders. Which, listening to what the lady said, I don't think we should call it emerging, but emerge young leaders or something <laughs> like that. I mean, um, I, I don't know if the word emerging is the right one. But can we, uh, maybe in the design, we'll talk about this uh, probably over lunch, in the design of, of these sessions, bring more, to, to use uh, Karim's word, energy, uh, and, and, and more, uh, you know, the, when I look at the emerging leaders, by the way, the gender issue is very clear there. It's 50%, 50%. So just by bringing more youth and energy to the panel, we will be more representative of uh, the, 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 the gender issue that uh, Madam Prime Minister mentioned. So uh, let's think of doing something like this in, 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 in how we manage things also here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Minister Levy? I, I uh, mentioned uh, some of the words that, that uh, were just said. I think uh, a partnership is a key word. Uh, I think that the way Brazil sees the relationship with the different countries of Africa and South Africa as a whole is a partnership. It's more than cooperation. It's really partnership. And that includes uh, our private sector, the experience of private sector. Uh, the lady had asked uh, uh, about Brazil and how uh, this is viewed. I think in some ways it's exactly what the president mentioned. Uh, people, including young people, there are plenty of young people that want to go. Of course, they have to have the glamour to be called agribusiness. And agribusiness can be huge, can be small, but if you see this as a business, as something that uh, really can expand, can uh, uh, provide for yourself, can, can uh, have innovation, uh, okay, people are uh, attracted. If you just say husbandry or you just say it's farmer, maybe uh, given the, the way uh, a young generation is, uh, uh, say, raised, is a little less attractive. But people in Brazil do see that as a business. You have to be successful. You, you have to have this uh, institutional framework to, to support, to, to irrigate it, in credit, knowledge, all of that. But it, it's a business. And a, a business thrive where you also have partnerships. And uh, I mentioned before uh, our, our Minister of Agriculture, and I think what is, is important is exactly, she decided uh, to stay in the business. She, she, she got a, a widow, she, she inherited the business, uh, she had uh, children and so on, and she decided to stay there, and uh, she rose uh, from the ranks in one of the expanding areas of uh, agriculture in Brazil, uh, which is what do we expect to see also in Africa? And, uh, and she really built a career uh, on that. 
And, uh, and now she has the experience of what is really important, not to politicians, but for, for farmers and, 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 and for people to, to thrive in business. And this is what she's, uh, she's trying, uh, she's bringing to, to government. And, uh, and I have to say that uh, I often get delighted in, in discussing this, because she knows the price of money. She knows when you have to support uh, a sector, how to do it in a way that's really effective. And, and I think this is uh, uh, something that we, we will see here in, in Africa, from the north to the south, in, in <coughs> many different guises in the coming years. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Just two quick announcements, one after the networking lunch. Uh, there will be a couple in-focus sessions, one in this room, and another one in the Medina uh, room just down the hall. Um, and then at 5 o'clock, please join us back here when we do uh, a session on energy security, which will uh, continue from where we're ending now. Please uh, thank you all for being a fantastic audience. And thank the, and, and, and thanking the panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>